So, I don't know about you, but I actually, I don't have much trouble saying no to something that I don't think I'll enjoy. However, saying no to something that seems awesome, I am exceptionally bad at. And that's why I've had a to-do list of personal projects besides my laptop since December of 2014 when I first discovered my passion for the visualization of data. I do cross things off every now and then, but new items appear just as fast. However, in hindsight, I don't mind this permanent lack of having enough free time left to actually get bored. My personal projects have given me opportunities that I didn't even know I was looking for, and they also played a really big role in me being able to pursue a freelance career uh, in 2017. And my favorite personal project is the one that I wanna share with you today. It was a year-long collaboration that I did together with Shirley Wu, who is, like me, a DataVis freelancer, uh, but she's based in San Francisco most of the time. Right now she's doing a residency in New York, but uh, I'm from Amsterdam. So to set the scene, a bit of background. Shirley and me first met virtually in a DataVis Slack channel before meeting in real life a few months later at OpenVisConf, uh, where we both had the honor to speak. And we really hit it off during those three days. And after, uh, after this, this conference, I was posting tutorials about the different aspects of my talk, and Shirley really jumped on them and started asking me all kinds of questions. And somewhere during those chats, we started lamenting the fact that we hadn't created as many more like, bigger data visualizations in the previous year. We'd been focused on other things. So some out of the blue, sometime, she just asks me, like, well, do you want to collaborate and create stuff? And I think it took me mere seconds to reply with an all capital yes. And that's how Data Sketches was born. So in the following week, we figured out that we both liked the idea where we would create a visualization each month around a specific topic and do that for a year, to see how two people would create two visualizations starting from the same seed, but then diverging into different paths based on our own interest in history. Well, besides sharing the end result, we also wanted to write about the creation process, and we split this up into the three pillars that we found most important, data, sketching, and coding. And initially we thought we could pull data sketches off with about five to six hours a week, but you know, real life really doesn't care about plans, especially coding plans, I found. So we've put in <laughs> many, many, many more hours than we initially planned. And during this talk, I'd like to take you through some of the lessons that I learned, challenges faced, and insights that I gathered along the way. So to start off with the most fundamental aspect of data visualization, the data itself. So while we were doing this, we often got questions on like, oh my God, how did you find that data? But it's, it's not the data that leads us. It's the topic of each month that first provides a spark of an idea, an insight that we might want to reveal, and then we can think about how we might visualize that and look for the appropriate data to actually make that happen. For example, the um, topic for November was books, pretty broad but I wanted to focus on fantasy books, and more specifically, the themes and titles of fantasy books. And once I have that more concrete angle, I do nothing more special than just Google the web, combining my specific idea with the words data or data set, and then having the patience to click through every link on the first two or three pages of results, and then iterating a few things in there. And this has led me to um, Google spreadsheets containing thousands of rows of Olympic medal winners, uh, like wonderfully unique GitHub repos, such as one with all the words spoken in the Lord of the Rings movies, and, um, and another one that contains a family tree of 3,000 people connected to royalty. Um, I've also learned that website design says nothing about the quality of the data it shares, by the way. <laughs> so there are also websites that contain structured information, but not in some ready-to-download format. Instead, I can scrape the logical layout of the website and put the information that it contains into a file with the help of some code. IMDb, for example, has an advanced search that can return a list of movies, and each of these movies is contained within the same set of divs and other elements. So I can basically download the HTML and then with the help of some code search for everything that follows a very specific styling. All of the movie titles could be contained within a div of class title, for example. And as another example, for my fantasy books, I could find, uh, on Amazon, I found a list of the 100 best-selling fantasy authors that I could then use. 
So there are also APIs from which you can request information, but I have to admit, I don't often use these because they can be a, quite a hassle to set up. However, sometimes the wealth of information found is just too good to ignore. So with those 100 fantasy authors that I scraped from Amazon, I then used the Goodreads API to request information about the top 10 um, most rated books of each of these authors, also requesting info about you know, the average rating and the total number of ratings, and of course, the titles of each of these books. Another good strategy can be to just ask others for advice. For, was it April, our topic was community. And I knew that I wanted to do something that kind of would fit the World Wildlife Fund. But I couldn't get my angle any more concrete than that. So I asked Twitter for advice, and I got a dozen or so interesting links, which led me to new links and so on, until I finally came across this page, where I saw a visualization of the greenness as measured from space in a week in June. And when I saw this, I knew I'd found my hook. I wanted to visualize the same information, but then animate it smoothly throughout the year and try my own spin on the visual styling, which eventually led to this. My clicker is not cooperating. Um, it's, it's, it's proved technically quite complex. It was a lot of data, but the visual itself is very minimalistic, where basically there is a title and a very simple legend, which I hope is enough for most people to understand what they are looking at. And yeah, like the next slide already showed, you can also create your data completely manually, no code required. So for our nostalgia month, I dove back into Dragon Ball Z. And I'll get back to the visual later, but uh, on the Dragon Ball Wiki pages, I found these lists of all the fights that occurred in the anime. And so I thought, well, I'll just copy and paste all of these lists into Excel, and with the help of some of Excel's functions, split them apart into the separate components. And it took me about two hours to get the data ready for these 200 fights, which I still think is a lot less time than if I tried to write a scraper that would handle all the nuances in these lists. And I also spent two hours really trying to find a proper data set on the characteristics of butterflies, but I had to resign myself that the best option seemed to be contained within a website called Gardens with Wings. If anybody ever still finds like a proper data set, I'm, I'm still interested to know. But you know, again, like previously, I felt that writing a scraper to go through this sort of semi-structured website was more trouble than doing it manually, so I just clicked through every option and put the information that I wanted into a final file of 87 different butterfly species. So what I have hoped to show you with all these different examples is that there's not just one specific way to find data. It's not just data analysts that have these skills. Data can be found in so many different ways, from Googling and finding your straightforward CSV or Excel file to scraping it or even making it manually. But be aware that probably you will need to clean or either restructure your data somewhat to make it ready for your visualization. And let me explain a little bit more about what those kinds of restructurings can be. So for um, August, the obvious theme is the Olympics, especially since we are both big fans. And I ended up visualizing all 5,000 gold medal winners since the very first Olympic Games in 1896. So each of these circles here is a group of similar sports. We have uh, water sports over here and ball sports over there. And then within each circle, each slice or feather represents uh, one sport. So we have athletics, which is really big. Uh, and then we have the first edition on the inside going outside to 2016. The female events are on the reddish background and the male events on the bluish background. And then finally, each medal itself is colored according to the continent in which the country lies that one. So Europe is blue, um, America is red, Africa is black, and you can see things from this. Like, for example, I had no idea that tug of war was an official Olympic sport. I'm basically kind of sad that we don't have like a national tug of war team anymore. So I first found the data for this piece from two articles published by The Guardian for the 2012 games in London. However, after getting a rough shape of the visual on my screen, I noticed that some very obvious medals were missing uh, from 2012, like hockey. So suddenly, my confidence in this data set dropped drastically, even coming from such a respectable source. So I had to get a sense of the overall accuracy again. However, I did not want to have to manually check 5,000 medals, so I found a proxy instead. On Wikipedia, I could find uh, lists that told me the number of events that occurred during each edition, which I could then compare to the number of gold medals I had in my data set, and if there was a discrepancy, I could investigate further to figure out where and why. 
And this uh, led me to figure out that in some of the editions, the horses were also in the data set, which made for an interesting read to suddenly see Princess and Sissy and Lady Mirka as women winning gold in the Olympics. Well, there were a few more of these funny things in there, and I had to make some adjustments, but eventually I got the data set back to a point where I trusted it again. So my lesson here is, and I do feel like I need to keep learning on this one, is that I really need to get a sense of accuracy and completeness of my data. It's actually sometimes harder to find missing data than to find wrong data. And you don't always have to check every value, but think about taking sums and counts and averages and either comparing this to plain common sense, can an average be higher than so and so, uh, or even better, a different data source. Also, staying with the Olympics, I also wanna talk about how you can restructure your data to make more unique and hopefully more effective visuals. So the standard bar and line chart are so common that you can create them with whatever tool that lets you do database. You basically supply the data and the tool does the visual heavy lifting for you. And the more that you start to deviate from these standard charts, the more that you'll have to supply other aspects of your visualization as well, such as where on the screen should the data be placed. And it can take a little bit of time to figure out and calculate these things, but it can get you some truly unique and hopefully effective results. For example, the Olympics piece is really nothing more than a whole lot of rotated and stacked bar charts. They all follow the same concept, but they also depend on each other. And initially, I tried to calculate the sort of the rotation that each of these separate feathers and slices would need to have uh, in JavaScript. But after having written like 30 lines of code and still not achieving something that I knew I could do in two lines in R, which is my favorite data prep and analysis tool, I pulled all of these preparations into R as well. So even if they were so-called visual variables, by which I mean that they have nothing to do with the data, but only with how it's laid out on the screen. So I calculated the initial rotation that each of these circles would need to have to eventually have their center at the bottom how far each of the inner slices would have to be rotated based on what came before. The only placement variable that I kept calculating in JavaScript to make it easily updatable to screen sizes was the year scale from the center outward. But even each metal's offset from the center point is something that I calculated beforehand in JavaScript, um, in R. So it is perfectly fine to calculate these sort of visual variables beforehand and attach them to your data set. And this can be handy for fixed data sets more often than you think because it can be much easier to calculate this outside of whatever tool you end up using to visualize your data bit, being JavaScript, Tableau, Power BI, or whatnot. For visuals that live on the web, it can also save you a lot of browser calculations, making it faster to load and interact with. Personally, also for me, it makes for a lot more readable JavaScript. I'm not, I write long JavaScript. So surely we have also filled many pages of our notebooks with sketches because they help us think and lay out ideas beforehand. And my sketches are actually usually very simple. I only focus on the main abstract shape that I want to fit my data into. You know, colors and layout and details. These are things I only vaguely think about but don't act on until I have the data on my screen. It's just that there's no, no use to spend time on these things until I figured out that the data actually works once I've morphed that into that abstract shape. For example, for the Olympics piece, I was inspired when I saw a peacock feather, which would kind of place emphasis on the more recent additions. But I had no idea if that would work once I place 5,000 medals together. So I had to see if that would fly um, before moving on. This was also one of the very few cases where the colors were kind of obvious to me from the start. Usually I start with like a rainbow pattern. It took a few steps, but eventually I got it to a point where it was working according to the concept I had in mind. And then I found, yeah, I can see insights from this, so I will continue with it and think about more of the visual design aspects. However, for networks, it is very hard to draw anything less abstract than circles connected by lines. And that is because the best most effective way to visualize the information is so inherent to the actual connections in the data. Um, for another month, or October month, the topic was presidents and royalty. And I've always been intrigued by how intermarried are the royal families? You know, are they your cousins twice removed or is it further than that? And thankfully I found this genealogy data set that contained the family tree of 3,000 people connected to European royal families going back more than a millennia. 
It was from 1992, so I had to spend a lovely evening on Wikipedia adding one or two more generations in the main line of succession, looking up some other famous royals in the meantime. And here is the end result, where the current royal leaders are the bigger circles, and then everybody's connected to their parents, their partner, and their children. And to visualize these sort of connections, I made two kinds of interactions. You can hover over a person and see how far six degrees of separation reaches into this web. So this lady, Pauline of Württemberg, I guess she's almost the grandmother of Europe, being connected to six current royal leaders. Uh, and we can also click on any person, like the Queen of England, and let's say, Sissy, and see their shortest path. So what is their closest connection? Uh, so these two are not quite closely related. However, the Queen of England and the King of Norway are basically like cousins twice removed, or something like that. But when I started out with this data set, I had no idea what it contained. So I basically just put all of the data on my screen using the most basic network settings, and then this happened. Literally, an explosion of points and lines moving out of my screen. So I thought, well, I'll make the gravity a little bit stronger. But then I was immediately left with a useless hairball. It's either this or the other. Coloring everybody by year of birth didn't really help either, but thankfully, in a browser, you can play with the laws of nature, and I could have gravity depend on a variable, which made it possible to pull apart the web by year of birth. This was better, but it was still a rather uninsightful bundle. And at this point, I'd already invested several hours into playing with the network settings, trying different kinds of connections and adjusting my data. And I was really ready to just give up and try a different angle, you know, like how much are the royals spending these days and how does that sort of convert to your like hourly wage? But I gave it one last try. And that's when I decided to focus on the current royal leaders. So I placed these in a line and then I let the vertical gravity depend on which of these royal leaders you were most closely related to. And that's when I finally saw it, insight. For example, that the Queen of Denmark and England and King of Norway are heavily interconnected, but the Prince of Monaco line separated from Europe 200 years ago. And only once I sort of had felt like I had a handle on the visual form did I start thinking about the visual design. And with my astronomy background, I have a bias for all things space, and networks often remind me of constellations, so that's, that's basically the only reason why I turned it into a starry night. And I could have never designed this visualization beforehand in something like Illustrator. I had to go hand in hand with the actual and total data set and apply my design choices to all of the data simultaneously to see if the results were both engaging and insightful. But getting back to actual sketching. During September, I made my most personal visualization ever. The topic was travel and I decided to visualize all of the vacations I've ever been on. So with the help of my parents and sorting through all of my analog childhood photos and travel journals, then I managed to create a list of all of my vacations. And I, I actually want to keep this month very simple. Just a row for every month that I've been alive and then colored blocks on the periods where I was on vacation. And then these blocks would be decorated to give an idea of what kind of vacation it was, who I was with, how much did I enjoy it, these kinds of things. So I drew the sketch around that idea. Uh, but when I looked at it closely, I realized that my mind had glossed over something rather important. Namely, that I'm only on vacation, only on vacation for a max of four to five weeks in a year. I mean, that's not bad, but it's less than 10% of a year. Whereas in this sketch, it looked more like I was on vacation for a quarter to a half of the year. So if I were to create this with the actual data, I would be mostly empty, which wasn't what I had in mind. So I thought about different ways to do it and eventually decided to try this, where I would squish any month in which I wasn't on vacation. That would make it very difficult to compare months exactly across all of the years, but that wasn't my main point anyway. I wanted to visualize trends in my vacations and see things like that it was mostly sun-driven during early childhood to culture in my teens and nature these days. And by sketching it out first, it helped me realize sort of the mistake in my initial approach and helped me gu guide me towards a new one. So here's the, sort of the final result of uh, like 30-ish years of my vacations. But I think the thing I liked most of this month was basically reminiscing with my parents what we all remembered from those vacations. And as another example, for the Olympics project, when I saw this peacock feather, I started drawing some feather shapes. And initially, I thought, well, I'll, I'll fill the ha both of the halves with like a full color for the country that won. But already during drawing, I was like, wait a minute, not, not every sport has only one medal, like athletics has many medals, so how would that work? 
And then the next day, when I tried to explain the concept to a friend at work, again, drawing out parts of it, I stumbled upon even more logical thinking errors that my mind had just glossed over. So only by sort of sketching it out several times, figuring out where I was going wrong and trying again, did I get to a shape that seemed to make uh, sense on paper. So the lesson here is that instead of going straight from an idea in your head or the data ready on your computer to coding it up or making it, first sketch out your design on paper. It is the ideal way to quickly catch thinking errors. And you don't have to be some sort of artist to do database design because it's mostly circles and rectangles and simple curves anyway. It's just that if you cannot make it work logically on paper, it is definitely not gonna work on the computer with the actual data. Another thing that I try to investigate while sketching is how to add extra details. How to supply more context around the main insight that I wanna convey. For example, the Olympics piece is already has a high density of data, but I couldn't resist adding information about the Olympic and world records because every athlete there tries to break at least the former, if not the latter. So I just added a small white dot on every medal that resulted in a record, such as Usain Bolt's 200 meter dash in Beijing. And a way for me to think about adding these extra details is to think about the visual channels that I still have available after I have my main chart standing. And let me explain that more with a, a different example. So during one week in the year, apparently more than half of the Netherlands listens to the same radio station. I know that's kind of weird. I mean, we're a small country, but still. Nevertheless, this happens during the final week in the year when the 2,000 best songs ever are aired counting down to the new year. It's quite a thing for the typical Dutch person, so I asked Shirley if our topic for December could be music so I could tackle these 2,000 songs. And I wanted to visualize what decade was most popular in terms of song release year. So here's kind of the base visual, where every circle is a song, and they're cl clustered to sit at the year of release, from the 60s until today. The bigger the size, the popular, like the higher the ranking in the top 2,000, and the darker the color, the higher the position they reach in the top 40s during that period of time. So we can see kind of that the 70s and 80s are the most popular decade, and then people are trying to forget about the early zeros. that are kind of picking back up again now. Uh, but I felt that there was so much more interesting information in this data set about artists, about songs and such. And also, the visual currently felt a little bit boring to me, like visually boring. So I thought about what kind of visual channels do I have available, and decided to use uh, stroked circles, uh, adding extra marks on top, and working more with annotations. So here is a sketch that kind of shows some of these ideas going on. Uh, and in 2016, sadly, uh, David Bowie and Prince died, so I definitely wanted to highlight all of their songs and kind of explain how that had changed this year with respect to the top 2000 of the year before. But I could also use the rankings of these songs in different ways, such as highlighting the most popular band or showing where the best song from 2016 was at, where was the highest riser or a newcomer, and kind of uh, to sing out that Pokemon song. It was the year of Pokemon. But all, even just to highlight the top 10 songs more clearly by adding an extra mark on top. And by adding these bits of information, I felt that the visual could be more fully understood uh, enjoyed and it made for a visually more interesting piece as well. So even if you have sort of your main chart standing, try and think about adding extra details. To use remaining visual channels to add more context about your visualization so that you can give the truly interested reader even more ways to dive into and understand the information. As expected, most of our hours are filled with actually getting the data on the screen. And here are some of my perhaps less obvious coding lessons. So the first month, the topic was movies. And it was clear to me pretty early on that I wanted to do something with The Lord of the Rings, which is my favorite trilogy. So I thought that with the popularity of these movies that there would be loads of data to be found online, but that did not turn out to be true at all. However, there was one true gem of a data set. This data set contained the number of words spoken by each character in each scene of all three extended editions of The Lord of the Rings. I mean, how amazing is that? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I don't care, I need to visualize this data set somehow. <laughs> 
So we started thinking about, you know, what do I find interesting about this? And figured that I wanted to see how many words have the characters of the fellowship spoken at the different locations throughout the movies. Uh, however, it's probably difficult to see, but there is no location information in the data set. So together with the scripts that I could find online and my own memory of having seen the movies way too often, I just manually added location information to all 800 rows of fellowship data. <laughs> you know, a little dedication, that was not, that was, yeah. <laughs> this was like typically what was happening during all of these months. So we started sketching some ideas for designs and eventually settled upon this one, where the members of the fellowship would be in the center and then the location spread around in a circle and the strings would connect it to where the thicker the string, the more words spoken by that character at that location. However, this chart form didn't exist. I mean, there was nothing that I could use to easily make it. However, it reminded me of something that did exist called a chord diagram. So I thought, well, maybe I can start from there and then see if I can slowly transform it into my sketch. Here is a basic stripped of all text chord diagram. And the most fundamental aspect to me was to see if I could somehow make these chords uh, flow towards the center instead, which took less time than expe uh, expected, which is pretty rare for me in coding, uh, but getting rid of the extra sort of space and it was now ready to handle the actual Lord of the Rings data and then uh, some better colors. Well, we have nine members of the fellowship, so making sure that the center kind of lines up at the right place. But this was looking way too squished, so my initial sketch wasn't quite gonna work out. Uh, I needed to create some space. Thankfully, though, my data set had a nice, like, 50-50 split, so I could pull these two halves apart. But now I felt that the, um, these, these strings were looking kind of unnatural, especially in the top and bottom. And what it does is basically I was still using D3 to calculate these shapes. It does that for me by making SVGs. And then I finally took it upon myself to learn how to write these SVG shapes myself, which was the thing that took longest in this project, kind of figuring out how to do that. But that's how, how slowly this, um, this new kind of chart form mutated from D3's chord diagram. Well, because there were so many strings visible, I added some simple interaction, just hover. So if you hover over a location, you see the people that spoke there. And if you hover over a person, you see the places where he spoke. And I also added a little bit of information below about some insight that I'd found for this character from this data set. For example, for Boromir, who is really only alive during one movie, still manages to speak more words than Legolas does in three. So yeah, I mean, um, you know, I also one thing that bugs me is that I spend quite some time trying to find the um, elfish translations of these locations and I will never know if I did it correctly or not. So many people have done wonderful things and they share this or ways to recreate that online. So even if you, you think you're creating something new, that doesn't mean you always have to start from scratch. Try and find a thing that most closely resembles your design and start adjusting that, you know, remix what's out there. And during this data sketches time, there's actually nothing that I learned more about than creating these custom SVG shapes and how they are connected to a whole lot more possibilities to shape my visuals. From simple curved instead of straight lines in my royalty network, uh, to sweeping arcs in my visualization about fantasy books, to the feather tips that I really did create for the Olympic feathers project, but that never made the final result. And the Olympics strings that started it all, and even these seemingly not related, but also custom SVG shapes between these circles in a visualization about card capture Sakura. And another visual that was highly dependent on these custom SVG paths has to do with our nostalgia month. And I decided to dive back into something that I was crazy about in my teens, Dragon Ball Z. So for those that sadly don't know it, Dragon Ball Z is an anime that revolves around fighting. So I thought it would only be fitting if I were to visualize all of the fights that happened during the entire anime, and then kind of show, you know, was there anything special happening, you know, um, who was fighting whom, was there Super Saiyan or other kinds of transformations going on, and other things. And the basic idea was to do this. So we have all of the fights going from top to bottom, and then from left to right are the different sagas, which are kind of similar to story arcs or seasons in a way. And to more easily follow a fight, uh, like a, a character from fight to fight, I wanted to connect all of their fights by a line. Well, a straight line seemed not fitting at all, so I used a collection of so-called quadratic Bezier curves, which give you the option to pull on a line by moving these sort of hidden anchor points. 
And to make it visually more interesting, I just decided to pull harder if the distance between two fights was farther apart. I got some great advice from a friend who said that maybe you can use the side of a fight to denote good guys versus bad guys. I mean, you know, sometimes data can be in the smallest things. And uh, so that, that kind of shows that for this character, for Jida, he started out as the main bad guy before moving around a bit and mostly becoming one of the good guys. And then adding in all of the extra characters. And this was actually revealing things to me about this, this anime that I'd never realized before, such as the main character, Goku. He's actually out of commission for very long stretches of time before he comes in and saves everybody due to being dead twice, which is not much of an issue, uh, and being sick once. But even though I was getting insights from it, I just wasn't liking these single thickness lines. They weren't quite conveying the dynamic nature of the fight. Instead, I wanted something different, more like uh, um, uh, varying thickness lines. So what I typically do when I want to create my own shapes now is just draw out my desired end state on plain paper and try and deconstruct it in terms of its sometimes mathematical or this time uh, SVG path coordinates which here came down to flipping the path back up again using different amounts of swoosh in a way. And by making that kind of small change, I felt that the visual now was kind of, it, it was more interesting and, and visually dynamic to look at. Another thing, uh, well, yeah, right, the lesson. So the th even though I was talking about SVG paths, the general lesson that I learned is that you really need to embrace your tool's advanced functionality if you want to go beyond the standard examples. So I was using D3 to make my SVG paths for two or three years before I finally learned how to make these paths myself. And they open up such a world for me in terms of being creative and possibilities in making my visuals. So I wish I'd done that sooner. Another thing that I always have fun with on my visuals is math. And here is our collaboration with Google News Lab. Uh, during which, as a um, non-native English speaker, I was interested to know, like, what do people want to have translated into English using Google Translate? From the most, ten most, sorry, the most translated word for 10 chosen languages to the top 10 for these languages, and finally, similarities between the languages. And originally, I wanted to string together these most translated words for these languages by a line that would be the 100 most translated words overall, and I wanted it to be very organic looking, something like this. But for the life of me, I could not figure out how to mathematically create something similarly organic that would update and resize the mobile and desktop screens. So I came up with this idea of beats on a string slowly zigzagging down. I basically always make mistakes in the math in my little notebook, which reveal themselves once you've coded it out. Um, but I got it working, and now I can use screen size to figure out if it should be four or three or two beats wide for mobile. And another thing that uh, was a fun logic puzzle to solve was about the final one, where I showed the similarities between languages. So if, there, if two languages had a, a word in common in their translation top 10, I wanted to connect that by a line. And initially, I actually wanted to have all of my visuals build up out of words as much as possible, the words they represented. So here, I wanted these lines to be the words. But once I created that, it was a complete mess. So I had to make a concession and only place the words on the um, lines going towards the central chosen language. However, then it suddenly became important that these words were in the most upright manner possible for readability. That, though, gave some convoluted calculations on the sort of the arced paths that all of these words are drawn on, which became glaringly obvious if you clicked one of these languages to make it move towards the center which I don't think is quite the animation that people might have expected. So that's where logic and math kind of came to the rescue. Granted, it took a few more pages in my notebook to figure out the logic and know how to kind of go around it, but eventually got it to work. And what I'm doing here is really more of a hack. So what happens is that if somebody clicks one of these languages to switch it around, I fade out the words, and then I immediately replace all of the lines by their final versions, but reverse engineer to look like the initial versions before smoothly transitioning them to the final versions. <laughs> it, yeah, it's not, it, well, it's working. So my lesson here is very simple. Learn to love math, especially geometry. I'm sorry, uh, because they are often your best friend in figuring out solutions to visual problems on how to lay out your data on the screen. So I want to end with one of my favorite lessons, 
and it has to do with our uh, February month. The topic was nature, and I, I've always wanted to do something more along the lines of generative or data art. And I thought like the, the concept, the randomness, the, the apparent randomness of nature was a very good match to that. And it also reminded me of butterflies, how their paths when they fly through the sky also feel quite random to me. So I wanted to mimic these butterfly-like paths across the screen using data from butterflies to guide the appearance of the, uh, the lines. So the color of the butterfly would kind of uh, signify the color on the screen, the species would define the line type, and the bigger the butterfly, the thicker the line. And then using loads of random number generators and inspiration by the works of Jared Harbaugh in Convergent, did I let my butterflies free across the screen. And this is the only month in which I make no attempt to make the data insightful. I basically wanted to create something based on data, but that would mesmerize people a little bit, like keep them wanting to watch the screen as it fills up with more and more of these paths. And creating uh, a sense of sort of delight can be a very handy tool to keep your audience engaged, especially in the more complex visualizations. And it can be done in many diverse and subtle ways. From, um, for example, I was on a flight back home, so I couldn't, I didn't have Wi-Fi, I couldn't really do anything critical. Uh, so I just made an animated legend of my visualization about fantasy books. And other non-essential things that I've added to my visualization are like animated GIFs of the most memorable moments in Dragon Ball Z. And even worse, you can click all of these and then go to a YouTube video, video of that point in the anime. I have no idea how many people actually did that. Um, I are having like a hover over each of these songs for the music visualization for people that really want to know exactly what song that circle is or making the top 10 songs look like tiny vinyl records or having annotations about uh, weird and silly events that happened in the history of the Olympic Games like Henry Pierce having to stop for ducks in the rowing event and still managing to win gold. So even though getting your data on the screen in such a manner as to make it insightful is key, also think about adding these other things such as uh, animations and annotations, weird legends, GIFs, and more that will make it even more of a delight to investigate for your audience and make it also more unique and memorable. So take the time to think about those things as well. So, one of the, an important aspect, and maybe the fun aspect of doing a collaboration, is that you are not in it alone. So sure, Shirley and me, we made our own visualizations, but we shared our results throughout the process. From discussing initial ideas, to sharing in the joy of finding an appropriate data set, and of course, sending across loads of screenshots of works in progress and giving feedback. So we started out as two people that had a good time in the conference and sort of knew each other, but during this time, we developed an incredible friendship and we talk to each other now almost daily and because we're both freelancers, we also work professionally together every now and then. So if you are thinking of embarking on an ambitious project, I can definitely advise you to try and find a partner. I feel that having somebody else there will keep you going more easily. Uh, I was way more motivated to work another evening on one of my projects if I saw screenshots coming in of Shirley's progress. Also, I didn't want to let Shirley down, so I was way more motivated to keep going. But it will be useful if at least one of you is responsible, so you don't both slack off, that it is someone that you respect and that you trust or that you can learn to trust, you think you can learn to trust, because that is crucial in giving and receiving feedback. And even though you might be very enthusiastic about getting started or you're still, you know, you just started out, know that these ambitious projects there will be a time when it will get hard and it will require a level of dedication. But even though you're having a bad day, try again on some other day because you will learn so many skills that you might not even consciously know about during this creation that you can then further explore during the creation of your next demo, app, visual, whatnot. So that's why I find these personal projects to be of really, you know, they're very important. And although I've been taking you along on a journey through my visuals and my, uh, my learnings, Shirley also made her own visualization for each month. And I quickly want to show you two of my favorites. So the first one is her take on our movie month called Film Flowers, in which she got the top summer blockbuster movies for each month that she's been alive and then turned them into flowers. So every aspect of the flower is some sort of data point, um, data something, like the petal shape is age rating, the colors are the genres, and so each movie turns into its own unique flower. 
And I really like this because it's so, the result is so artful. You kind of print it out, but you can still look and kind of try and find trends and see insights from that. The second one is about Hamilton. So even though it was published during the uh, books month in November, she'd been working on this three months prior to that. That's how crazy she is about, uh, about Hamilton. I can definitely advise you to check this out. And I, uh, it's about all of the lines spoken. And she, I really like this project due to how the, the sense of delight that you get while going through and interacting with the different elements on the page. So during this project, I learned that I mean, data can be found in many different ways. That it is not blasphemy to pre-calculate visual variables. That sketching helps weed out thinking errors, but that you can also sketch with code. That SVG paths are amazing, and math is too, but I kind of already knew that. And that surprisingly small things can create a sense of delight for your audience. And we didn't set out to learn or be confronted by these things. We just wanted to have fun, and in that we definitely succeeded. However, when I started freelancing as well, it was too much. So. Uh, the final two projects actually took a whole year to complete. And Shirley actually is still working on her final project. It's been in like, it's almost done. And it's almost done because we're turning it into a book where we're telling even more about the learnings that we had, the things that we do, screenshots and everything where you can see how we were munging our data and converting our visualizations into usually, uh, hopefully fun and weird and often overly elaborate visualizations. So if you enjoyed this, maybe, maybe the book in I don't know when might come anyway. Um, but thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>